Hello Unity fans, it's time for part 3 of my series of videos in which I'm reviewing and also adding on to Catlike Coding's Hexmap tutorial. I'll link to the previous videos in the description or you can follow the link in the top right right now to start at the beginning. At the end of part 2, we had populated our base geography with all kinds of features, roads, rivers, buildings, plants and walls. We are now ready to add units. To facilitate unit movement, we need to consider distances, pathfinding and movement animation. Exploration is usually an important component of hex map games, so we also cover fog of war, uncovering the map when exploring and advanced vision, where the terrain influences a unit's vision. To make it easier to visualize our workings, we add a grid texture to the terrain shader. Adding a multi-compile directive to the shader gives us variants with and without the grid. This can be toggled on and off as required by adding a UI component as well. Next, we add an edit mode toggle to swap between map editor and the unit movement mode. We also adjust our coordinate display system so that we can rather display distances between hexes. We start off by just calculating the lowest number of hexes from each cell on the map to the selected cell or the shortest path. However, this does not take obstacles into account. In preparation for navigating obstacles, breadth first search is implemented and tested on an empty map. The search process is visualized and slowed down so we can track what it's doing. Next, we let the search algorithm treat water and cliffs as obstacles it cannot pass and it looks for a way around them. This leads to islands that cannot be reached. These obstacles are binary, completely blocking the passage. We add another binary obstacle, namely walls. But we also want to add non-binary movement costs. Certain terrain should be more difficult to get through, but you should still be able to travel through it. On the other hand, a road should make travel easier or faster. So we add movement cost to the calculation making roads much easier to travel and hexes with features more difficult to get through. Traveling across slopes also leads to higher movement cost. The breadth first search cannot handle these variable costs properly, so a priority queue is added to the search algorithm, indicating which of the cells on the frontier should be visited first. It now happens that a certain path to a specific hex found later in the search process could be a shorter path than a path found earlier in the process. In these cases, the movement cost to the hex needs to be updated. This approach is called the Dijkstra algorithm. But knowing distances between hexes is not enough. We also need to be able to find a path between selected starting and destination hexes. To show the workings, we implement a visualization method by which a highlighted hexagon outlines all hexes on the chosen path. In order to remember the path taken, you have to store the hex from which each hex in the path has been reached. As soon as the destination hex has been found, you can follow the references back to the starting hex. This algorithm does find the shortest path, but it spends a lot of time investigating possibilities that, to us at least, are obviously pointless. The next step is to make the search algorithm smarter. We achieve this by adding a search heuristic. This is a factor that is added to the movement cost between neighboring hexes whenever a decision needs to be made on which hexes to try next in the search. The heuristic we add is the shortest possible movement cost from the next candidate hex to the destination hex, as if it were connected by the most easily traveled terrain on the shortest path between them. So if a candidate hex starts being too far away from the ultimate destination, it makes no sense visiting it, and the search can be halted in that direction. This reduces the number of hexes that need to be visited in total. We could make the search heuristic more stringent to reduce the search branches even more, but that could lead to mistakes in very specific scenarios. Adding such a heuristic to the search algorithm changes it into what is called an A star search algorithm. But the implementation of the A star algorithm is not yet efficient, mainly because the frontier of hexes is still sorted for each iteration. To get rid of this sorting and increase performance, we implement a proper priority queue instead of a sorted list. Next, 
Displaying movement cost on the hexes is converted into displaying turns required to move there, assuming a certain specified movement rate is associated with each unit. Finally, some more optimization is performed to ensure the search algorithm does not drag down the frame rate. This includes even smarter searching as well as displaying path information only on the chosen path rather than all candidate hexes. And now, at last, the time has come to have mobile units on the map. Units are added to the map by instantiating a specified prefab with a random rotation, setting the unit's location as the hex it was created on. We handle things like destroying units, not allowing more than one unit per hex, and adjusting the position of units when the terrain is edited. Saving and loading maps now also need to be updated to cater for units. Many of the existing functionalities now have to be reworked in order to be linked to the units. This includes selecting cells as destinations rather than editing them, displaying and updating paths when a unit is selected, and not allowing paths to pass through hexes that are already occupied by other units. In order to get our units actually moving across the map, we start a coroutine which interpolates its position between current cell and next cell in the path at a certain speed until the entire path has been traveled. This looks kind of choppy since the changes in direction are sudden. To get smoother direction changes, we apply a quadratic Bezier curve whenever a turn happens. So the sudden angle change at the center of the hex turns into a gradually changing angle as the unit moves through the hex. We also let the unit turn to always look in the direction of movement. Although adding actual unit models and animations is not covered in the tutorial, I was able to get something quite decent implemented in very little time by replacing the blue cube prefab with an actual model with a walking animation and updating the code here and there. Now, as these units move across the map, they should provide visibility of their surroundings, while known parts of the map not currently seen by any units should be shrouded under so-called fog of war. One approach to achieve this would be adding a visibility indicator to the mesh data. However, this would require the triangulation to be re-performed each time visibility changes, which is resource intensive. Another possibility is marking the terrain with a semi-transparent surface on top of it. This can work well for flat terrains with restricted possible view angles, but our terrain contains varying elevations and we could easily peek in underneath this covering surface unless the surface is fit tightly around the terrain features, which is also resource intensive. The approach we go with involves passing the cell data to the shader via a texture while rendering, separate from the terrain mesh. Costly triangulation is therefore only required to happen once, and the less costly steps of adjusting a texture and performing a few more texture samples provide the visibility adjustments. This part gets quite technical, and all the triangulation instances where color and terrain type were set now has to be replaced by a method setting indices and weights. At this stage, each unit has a fixed vision range of three hexes in all directions, and the shader renders all hexes that do not fall within this vision range darker. But the features are still completely visible, since they are not part of the terrain shader, so the buildings, trees, farms, roads, rivers, water and walls should still be darkened by a fog of war. The same process is applied to all the different shaders, taking care of the procedurally generated features. For the features based on prefabs, a new feature shader is created, that can also take care of the visibility information by looking up the applicable hex based on the feature's world position. Next, we need to completely hide the parts of the map that has never been explored. A visibility flag is added to the fog of war information and sent to the shaders, which uses it to render unexplored areas completely black as a starting point. The shaders need to be adjusted to specular, so that these shaders do not reflect anything. Finally, the black color is replaced by a custom background color. The process is repeated for all the features to ensure everything is hidden. The final step is to prevent units from finding paths through unexplored terrain but rather go around it. This is achieved by adding the explored state to the function that determines whether a hex is a valid destination. All that remains is to adapt unit vision according to the terrain surrounding the unit. We don't want a unit to be able to see what happens on the far side of the mountain. We also want units on higher elevations to be able to see further, 
and we want to hide the hard edges of maps by making the last border hex unexplorable, so that it blends in better. Finally, we let the fog of war fade in and out gradually as the units move. And that concludes this part of the tutorial. In the final part, we will see how we can procedurally generate realistic random maps. Please stay tuned.